recording now. So we start, the record is on. Please go ahead, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to have you here. Um, thank you, George, for the introduction. And um, I'll be introducing Hanan, our guest talker today. Um, Hanan Ben Khalouf is a consultant with a broad um, range of expertise and different backgrounds. She is a business practitioner with over 16 years of ex professional experience. Um, she, is, uh, she holds senior managerial positions in government and nonprofit organizations. She has um, different backgrounds from industries such as the financial services, real estate, um, and also retail and franchise development. She has um, uh, an, M an MBA in marketing and finance, as well as a certification of master finance development. Um, uh, Hanan also headed the entrepreneurship and innovation in the Arab world at the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Foundation. Um, and she also leads and helps uh, young entrepreneurs who want to establish their young businesses, um, who are also wanting to start fresh. And she works with them from concept ideation to the completion and development of that. She also has different backgrounds in leadership, entrepreneurship, as I mentioned, innovation. And basically, um, you know, she gives them career advice and uh, career programs. You know, she tells them and she gives them advice and to help them grow within their careers. Um, so that's just like a mini introduction for what Hanan has, you know, in the, her contributions to um, the ever-growing market. And so this is the topic that we wanted to highlight today is how can we be relevant in today's society? How can we um, start to think about the benefits that we can give to, to society as well as still be important and understanding what we want to do as young talents? Um, so that's why Hanan is here with us today. And thank you, Hanan, for taking the time to join us. Um, I will hand over the, the, the mic to you. I just wanted to say, guys, um, please feel free to ask anything you want to ask about in the Q&A section at the bottom, um, or you can ask me directly in the private chat. Um, I will be relaying these questions on to Hanan towards the end of the session. And that's it from my side. Again, thank you for everyone for being here and over to you, Hanan. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, George. I'm really pleased uh, to be part of your webinar series and to have an opportunity to uh, address youth and who I think are the future, especially in today's world. So um, I'll, uh, I hope whatever I'll be sharing today, because it's mainly I'm going to be telling the story, telling my experience. I'm not here to lecture, but I'm really here to give some practical advice based on my own experience. And from there to see, um, hopefully I would inspire you, evoke from you so that you can start reflecting and how you can find your purpose yourself and how you can make from your career more than just uh, a post-graduation position, but rather something bigger than that, which is what we should all aspire for. And I have a saying, I always say, I aspire to inspire before I expire. And that's why I never say no to invitations like this. So thank you for having me. It's a great opportunity for me and an honor. Um, let me share, I have a presentation, some slides that will work as background for me. So I'm going to stop with that. There you go. So I entitled this presentation, Key Career Success Drivers. Um, actually, all of us want to finish our studies and start a successful career. That in today's world, it takes more than just having a degree. So uh, like I said, I gathered some information based on my own experience that I want to share with you. And I would love to make it more interactive, at least with some, even if you can just uh, throw in some comments in the chats, it'll be really, really more beneficial to all of us because we all learn from each other in spaces like these. So I wanted to start, um, Laura told you about your questions that you can ask any time, but I wanted to start with a question. And I hope that few of you at least can share uh, in the chat box and Laura will share with me. Why are you really here? I mean, what, what drove you to this session? If you are present today and you saw probably you received an invitation or you saw the flyer somewhere um, in social media, why, if you can just say it in a word or two words, why are you really here today? We'll take a minute to get some answers just to get a feel of um, the, you know, how is everybody feeling about this uh, topic or to get a sense of the expectations as well, because it's, it's always helps me to read the room. It would have been easier when we used to do these sessions face to face, but 
we have to adapt. So let's see virtually even if we can get some sharing for you. Some thoughts. I send some answers. Let's see what you have. Yeah. I think they're pretty shy at the moment. Okay, that's fine. So you can, you can always plan. Okay, great. Um, to get a sense um, of direction and what path to take. Amazing. That's that's a great answer, actually. Perfect. And I think some of the information that will be here will answer to some extent that question. Okay. And we'll take some more if they come. Thank you. All right. So it's good to know why you're really here. And uh, yes, and knowing what career path to take, especially in uh, the world we live in today, is a bit probably a bit more challenging than how we had it. So let's let's take a look at the world today. Oh, I brought in some refresher refreshers to really get a feel of the world that you as talent after graduating you will have to be operating in. And I want you to meet some some of my current friends. So the way the world we live in today is the world where Sophia is a very intelligent national talent from Saudi Arabia. Let's look at who Sophia is. This is Sophia. I don't know if you've ever seen her. I had a pleasure to meet her and speak with her. Sophia's AI, artificial intelligence. She's a robot. She's the first robot to have had a passport and not too far from us, a Saudi passport. So my point is that Sophia could be your colleague very soon. Could be, it's not the future, it's the present actually. Could be your team member. Could be where I want you to say also hello, and I said hello to Pepper in Emirates Towers. If you go to Emirates Towers at Emirates MBD Bank, you will see him. So Pepper is an engaging customer service employee who takes selfies with you. And today's world, this is how your career delivery looks like very soon. Probably it's already happening actually in the UAE. So my point is that the world has changed and what we, what we refer to as Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is more of a technological revolution, is, it is a revolution to the business environment. So today is a global environment. There is no, no borders anymore as far as business is concerned. Um, there are unprecedented advances in technology, which means there are many changes in consumer demand and any consumer, whoever you're going to be serving with the work that you will be doing, in your career, and also the evolving demographics with so many connected customers, so many connected people, and also the new generations like yourselves, and you will find yourself in this, they are more purpose driven. So we are dealing with a different breed of customers. We are dealing with a complete different business environment, different uh, consumer behaviors, and all of that will definitely impact the way we have to look at the career that we want to take because every career means that we are serving a target of beneficiaries, whether they're consumers, citizens, employees, no matter what career path you take, you will be serving somebody, you will be serving a target audience. And that target audience lives in today's world, which you have seen is completely different in an unprecedented way. And I don't even want to get to um, what happened last year because it's exactly the same. I used to talk about this even before the pandemic. What the pandemic did is just accelerate it what was happening anyway, probably was gonna happen in the next five, six years. But the remote working, the fact that we are talking to each other today this way through a screen, all of this has just been accelerated, but it was coming. And it's good that it's been validated so that we all kind of awaken and see how we can be ready and prepare to thrive in this kind of world. So more of, of impact of this world uh, or the new world or the 4.0 is these trends how will the work environments look in the future for you, young talent? This is what to expect. Remote workforce is the new norm, definitely. We can see it. So are we ready to work that way? Is the career we're looking for can be really um, embraced and, and can be excelled at using the remote workforce? Everything digital. So today, everything digital. And when I showed you, Sophia, I was referring to this 
um, we can no longer stay away from human machine integration. It's coming. We'll have to be at ease to integrate as humans to working with machines. And uh, we'll move more to knowledge workers. I've seen the report by the World Economic Forum that by 2055, there's a speculation. It's not, it's not, we don't know, but still these are all predictions that 50% of the jobs performed by humans could be replaced by machines, which means we're moving towards knowledge workers. We are everything that has to be by the hands could be, could be uh, moved to automation, which means we will need more use in our head which means knowledge, which means innovation, which means that we have to, all, to acquire different uh, skills that I'm going to talk about in a little while. So what's coming from that as well is there is so much uh, anxiety, so much speculation, as I said, we're talking about the loss of um, you know, 7.1 million jobs worldwide, 60% uh, of administrative jobs will be lost, one thing we know, I don't know about the numbers, I cannot really say they are true because they're based on forecasts, but one thing I am positive and certain of is that all jobs will be performed differently. So I wanted to ask you first, do you know what job you want to have? If I ask this question, and I would like Laura to keep an eye on the chat or the Q&A as we move, do you, if anybody has already an idea about the job that they want, if you are almost graduating or if you have graduated or if you're still um, even at the first year of, of university, do you, if you can just share with us what is the job or the role, if you have one in your mind, please do. We have architecture as a response so far. Great, okay, perfect. So, another one. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Any other ones? Some people don't know. This is the uncertain answers. Okay. Um, graphic designer. Okay. Amazing. So whatever you are planning to do, I just want you to remember that your job, by the time you start, um, you know, practicing it, will be performed differently. So the question is here: Are we really prepared for this new work environment? And I'm. I'm I'm talking to, you need to think about the question that we use to all hear what you want to be when you grow up. So today, look at that number. We can no longer ask a kid who's in primary school that question because 65% of kids in elementary school who are now in elementary school will have jobs that do not exist and are still unknown till today. Maybe not just the primary school, Maybe even yourself, the job that you're planning to have in five years, maybe it will be unknown, it will be something else. A lot of jobs are emerging. Yes, automation, artificial intelligence, and, and the fourth industrial revolution is making a lot of jobs redundant, but it's creating new jobs. So the point is we have to be ready. We should not box ourselves into a role, but rather think about what is the impact that we want to have on the world? What is the purpose that will be driving this career? regardless of the job that you're going to have, because it might change. Look how things are changing so fast. I'm sure, and there is nobody in this room who doesn't have a smartphone, for sure, 100% sure. And each of you who's having a handheld device called smartphone, you know as much as I do, that from time to time we receive update software. Update, that shows you how everything is getting obsolete. And it's not just the apps or the softwares that will be applied to all of us, to our knowledge, to the way we want to do work. So we need to be ready as much as we press that update, we have to always be ready to update our knowledge because no matter what we learn, no matter what the degree we have, no matter the experience, it doesn't mean anything anymore unless it is relevant to today's world, to the role of today, which is being redefined and that happened. I mean, we went through, if we are talking about fourth industrial revolution, that means that we had three before and each of them brought its own share of changes. We can all look uh, online to history and see how the first uh, industrial revolution, second, third, and now we have in the fourth. The difference today is that it is happening at a very, very fast pace. We can't even keep up. And that's why, and that's what I want you to really keep in mind that no matter what role you're planning to have, no matter what career path, we need to start asking a few questions that are coming soon. All right. So 
again, just some data so that you know that this is not coming from me. I do my research before coming and really uh, uh, sharing with you why you need to be relevant today. By 2025, more than one third of workers will need skills they don't now have. Just imagine that. So if we don't embrace a growth mindset, to be always ready to learn new skills, to be always ready to update, like the software I just mentioned, the analogy, then we'll, we're having a problem. We don't even know what skills we will need. And that's from uh, Economic Forum, the World Economic Forum. So, and that's a research I would like you to look at. It's the future of jobs that shows also, and you'll be surprised at some titles of jobs that will be in the future. There is something called um, disruption officer, work disruption officer. And beginner, I said, how could somebody have a job of being disruptive? And then when I looked into it, means that somebody who makes sure that you're not, you don't get into that routine so that you innovate all the time. So somebody comes and disrupt your work. So you get into the mindset of innovating. There is chief happiness officer, um, chief people, uh, chief people uh, experience of people, something like that. Some, some really, really unconventional uh, titles that are already actually um, embraced and practiced by some big companies. So not only the jobs we don't know, but we also don't know the skills that we need. We don't have the skills today that will be needed for the jobs for tomorrow. So the question comes, how do I remain relevant? Because I share with you all of those facts to come to this Conclusion that today it's not about being the expert. It's not about having the PhD and the degree. It's about, am I relevant to today's world? What you see in the picture behind, maybe some of you listening to us didn't even see this, don't even know about that, that's gone. And that's how we grew up listening to music. So how do I become relevant so that I switch from the tape to the iTunes, for example? Um, one question, I don't know, maybe you can answer, how do we remain relevant? If you think of something, please make it interactive as much as we can. What comes to mind when we say, how can we remain relevant? Anyone guys? So I guess my answer is by learning how to surf. And I don't mean that in the, you know, in the proper meaning of the word, because the word today is, is like a wave, a whole wave of disruption uh, that is uh, really taking us and overwhelming us, as you can see. So the first thing I would say, it's one word, it's one sentence, learn how to surf, which means we need to learn how to ride this wave of disruption. I would say probably having the job of becoming an entrepreneur and then be like, but I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a graphic designer. And then I would say, so but what is the definition of entrepreneurship anyway? Is it we owning a business? This is what most of us think, right? I think entrepreneurship is a solution, but because I uh, come from the school that defines entrepreneurship differently, that never thinks of entrepreneurship. I do work with a lot of entrepreneurs and I've been working in the entrepreneurship field for the past 13 years, but this is how I define it. Not me, actually. The word entrepreneurship, the definition of the word entrepreneur comes from the 13th century French verb entreprendre, which means simply in French, I'm sure many of you speak French here, just like me, it means to do something or to undertake. So that means becoming an entrepreneur means I create, I take risks, I live my passion. That's what makes me an entrepreneur. It is not about owning a business. So the world of today needs us all to be entrepreneurs, no matter what the job we will take. It means we have to always innovate, create new things, because this is the only way we will remain relevant means we'll take risks because the world is changing all the time. It means we need to innovate and innovating means start trying something that's different, that's out of the norm, out of the ordinary. And doing that means we're taking the risk that it might fail, it might succeed. And being an entrepreneur means I'm driven by passion. And we're gonna talk a lot about passion today. That's what entrepreneur means. So becoming relevant or remaining relevant starts 
by being able to ride that wave of disruption means to be learning how to surf, to be resilient. So whichever way it's going, we need to go with it. We cannot really uh, resist it or just sit there and wait for the wave to go. Because if we wait, the wave will take everybody to those new shores of opportunities and we'll be missing them. And second thing, we need to embrace an entrepreneurial mindset and think of entrepreneurship that has nothing to do with owning a business. And I think especially many of you are in the design architecture, you will be an entrepreneur because you are creating new things. You are adding value to your customers. So you need to find out how you, you can remain relevant. Because if you're an architect, architect, tomorrow, very soon, we're going to be having homes or buildings that are 3D printed. So if you keep yourself only thinking about architecture in the old way of how we look at architecture, we might really be obsolete by the time you start working. So we need to be abreast of the changes. We need to take those risks. We need to learn new things that are within our field. But at the end of the day, I need to ask, who am I serving? And how are their needs changing? And how are the how is the environment where I operate change? How can I, because at the end of the day, I'm an architect means I create, um, I design or I create landmarks or I create um, sustainable pieces or I create, you have to define it in a way that has nothing to do with engineering or design because that's the how. But we need to link our career to a bigger why and I show you how I did mine. So because I really want to inspire you to do the same because once you link your career to something that is adding value or adding positive impact. And it could be from somebody who's going to open a, a, you know, a, a bake shop to somebody who's going to be working rocket science. It does not matter. These, what I'm talking about does not only relate to anything that's very sophisticated. Anything we do can be linked to that added value, to that value proposition that we are giving to the audience that we are serving. So I have to know who I'm serving and I need to know how am I improving their life, their operation, their work, whatever it is, from a student to a citizen, if I'm going to work even in the government. Yeah. So that was, you, you also asked, I mean, I asked, why are you here? And you answered. Now, it's my turn to say, why am I here? Um, Laura did a great job in introducing me, and I did not continue in that because I wanted to bring it to context. So why I'm here, and this is what I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey, was starting by, this is how I always introduce myself. I was made here. This is Casablanca in Morocco. So that's where I was born, and I say that I was shaped here in New York City. And I say shaped because living in New York City does shape you. And I chose this picture with the, with the towers that you all know don't exist anymore because I lived it and I learned a lot. I learned how to be resilient because the changes that we are seeing today with the technological revolution or with the pandemic, it's not the first time. We had different uh, crises and that was one of them that I lived that I lived when I was still a student and I learned a lot from it, how we need to adapt. And I have been thriving in Dubai since 2005. So when I look at it, it's my journey for me, it was more like a, a Ferris wheel ride. Um, you know, it was enjoyable. Sometimes it was, it would take me to the top when I have really a big picture. Sometimes it brings me down when I can't see anything, depending on the angle. So we all go through this, on, on our journey, we all go through highs and lows. We just have to learn to look at things from different, different perspectives. Sometimes we see the big picture, sometimes we narrow it if we really want to find out what is, what is that purpose that we have. So for me, that journey from Casablanca, as you saw, to New York, to Dubai, um, included 18 years of management uh, positions. I'm not gonna bore you with that. You can always look up my profile, but this is just a summary from government, Fortune 500 companies, even NGOs. But throughout and across that experience, came my conclusion, which later on was the turning and the shift of my career into what I do today. And I'm, and I'm introducing myself this way, as I said, so that you can see that when you think about your career, you need to think about it beyond the uh, topic or the industry. For me, I found out that we don't really build businesses, we build people and then people build businesses. So everything I do today is related to people-centric strategies, to human-centric business models. 
whether we look at the customer, we look at students. For me, this is, I felt that whatever I worked, and I worked in finance, insurance, retail, hospitality, you name it. And that was when I looked at what is my passion? Where do I thrive? What, is, what are the moments that I really love working on? I mean, I worked in so many industries and one common denominator was that I love working with people. And I found out that it's the people who create. It's not about having the technologies, it's the human capital that matters. And in my experience with, um, at the, uh, I was really honored to be part of at Sheikh Mohammed Bernash the Maktoum Foundation. One of the projects I was in charge of was a study that was mandated to the PricewaterhouseCoopers, the global um, research company that you're a consulting company. And that research was about the Arab human capital challenge. So it was a study that showcased that, is, that there is a gap between the skills that we learn in, in schools and the skills and competencies that are needed at the workplace. And to me, that was the Eureka, you know, the bulb. Like, okay, well, I work, I'm working now to diagnose a problem, but I don't want to be only there to, you know, a finger point in the problems. I want to be part of the solution. And that's how I started Sustained Leadership Consultancy, which is my small business, but that's working with big companies, with governments to really focus on this line that we need to build people if you want to build sustainable economies. So my mission today could be summarized in these words and you can see some of them. This is how I'm practicing it, to hone leadership skills, really help create and build generations that can lead. And leadership is not an authority, it's a skill that everybody needs today because we're moving towards more flatter organizations. Everyone has to have the, the, the leadership skills to take decisions. I'm very, very much an advocate of female talent advancement and I call it advancement, not empowerment because I feel uh, everybody has the power. We just need to be advanced. I work um, a lot with the government on developing national human capital because I, I feel that we need to leverage on our human capital in all our countries in the Arab world. I work with business leaders, uh, cultivate innovation by being part of innovation centers and universities and working with a lot of incubators across the region. I work a lot on change behind me. I was speaking in a conference and you can see VUCA world. If you haven't heard of VUCA, it's the world I was just describing to you. It's, a, it's an acronym and it's a terminology that is very trendy now. It's volatile and certain complex and ambiguous. And I think you could all nod that this is exactly the world we live in and we operate in. Very volatile, very uncertain, very complex, very ambiguous. We cannot really predict the future and we need to be at ease to manage and embrace that change. And that's part of the work I do. I work a lot with startups. So I did all of this because I'd love each of you to go back and it doesn't, it doesn't come easy, but start thinking whatever work I'm gonna do, what would be my mission? I'm not saying I train. I'm not saying I, I consult. I'm staying away from the how, but I'm looking at why, the, what, what is my why? What is that big, big picture that I would achieve, which is bigger than myself. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm running a very, very small business, but I look at a purpose that people would be like, well, you're not the government. And I think, yeah, but it, if each of us contributes to the change, even with a 0.0001% collectively, we can all contribute to that bigger change, which is here summarizing, this is my dream, this is my purpose. That's what um, helps me wake up every day and get excited about my day. And my vision, and I would like you all to have your vision, one statement, I have three here, uh, my vision is to help grow value-driven, human-centered organizations. Whether I work with small businesses or multinationals, when I go in, this is what's uh, in my mind. How can you have your employees to be value-driven, purpose-driven, so that they have loyalty? How can we produce products and services that are centered around the customer? And that's what we call human-centered organizations. Um, also, a big advocate, like I said, fa facilitating diversity and inclusion. I put it in one word. And at the end of the day, my BHAG, uh, if you ever heard of this um, term, which is big, hairy, audacious goal, is to contribute with the very small work I do to the move of our Middle East and Africa region into a knowledge and innovation-based economy. So I, I hope I, I, you know, I shared this with really that hope of inspiring you to going back and starting to think about that big picture. So how did I get here? It wasn't smooth. 
it was just like walking. That's me, by the way, walking on that shaky, br sorry, shaky bridge in Pakistan. Yeah, I do. I do uh, practice what I preach. When I say entrepreneurship means taking risk, I do take a lot of risks. So I go travel to unlikely places. So really, that picture reminds me when I was there three years ago on that bridge. I I finished that that walk on that shaky bridge. And at the end of it, because you have to go back and forth, it wasn't easy. And I thought, but this is exactly life of an entrepreneur. You have to take risk. It's not always smooth, but you have to keep looking. You have to take it step by step. You have to be cautious, but you have to keep your eye. If I look down, I could have fallen, but you have to keep your eyes on the destination. How I get there, this is what I'm gonna share with you, my three Ps. And it took me years to realize that what drove my career humble success and my career journey is three Ps and those three Ps came as um, my participation in a book that was uh, that was published last December 2020, 2019, sorry, no, 2020. It's because we finished it with the, uh, with the lockdown. We thought everybody needed a dose of motivation. So you will find me speaking about my three Ps that I'm gonna share today in this book, um, uh, Your Dose of Motivation. And I took a quote from there because that's exactly what I felt throughout my journey. No one will simply give you what you want in the professional world. All of us, we need to put in the effort to seize it for ourselves. So what are my three Ps that I feel can drive career success? The first P is passion. I know it's like a buzzword. Everybody speaks about it, but trust me, it's valid. Passion is the first P that could lead to a career success. When we do something that we love, that we're passionate about, we're going to find ways to make it happen. But I'm not here just to say what it is. I'm here to share with you as well. What is passion? It's simply doing what you love in three words. It's something that gives you identity. This is what I'm passionate about. Whoever sees you when you start talking, I'm sure you feel it now. When I started talking about my journey, the first thing that I always hear, we could feel how passionate about your job you are. And I, and I, you know, it's it's clear because I am passionate about what I do. And I would really wish every one of you to find that career path that to do something that you're passionate about because that's the success to happiness. It's not how much money you make at the end because trust me, I gave up a job in the IFC in Dubai International Financial Center in investment banking because you reach a point, it's good. I'm not saying that we, you know, we don't need to make money. It's good to make money. We need money to have a good living. But you reach a point where it doesn't really make it for you. It's, and you see, I'm sure you see around you a lot of people who are having successful careers if we measure success by money, but they're not really happy. So the happiest people are the ones who could make money by doing something that they love. And, and that's my wish for all of you. And I'm really grateful that I could find what I'm passionate about at an age that I can still give. So passion is where your heart is. And you can, I can already start triggering your mind to think, what are you passionate about? And I came with some questions that will help you do that. So you don't have to answer the question here, but you could use these questions and start reflecting if you really want to find your passion. This is a whole workshop that we do on a whole day to help people find your passion, but at least I want to evoke, help you evoke. So this is the first question. If you were to do one thing for a lifetime without getting paid, what would it be? Or let me rephrase it. Let's say somebody comes and gives you a blank check and told you to write, you know, they just write a number one and say, put as many zeros as you want in the check and it's yours. So that concern of the financial independence is sorted. And the check is done in the safe and you know that you won't have to worry about money for the rest of your life. If that's the situation, <clears throat> I want you to visualize that, then what would be that one thing that you would want to do for life without getting paid and you'd be happy doing it? So I want you to think about that. Um, another question, what did you love to do as a child? Look back and think of activities that you used to enjoy since an early age. That starts already setting the pattern of what you are really passionate about. If you could talk about one thing for hours and it brightens you up, think about when you go out with your friends, when you have projects in university, all these things. What is that one thing 
that you could talk about when somebody's when you have a topic that you're discussing with your friends or your classmates and that's the one thing that you're so happy and you can tell that it really makes your face shine and lastly if you could be known for three things what are those it's a good exercise to ask people around you your inner circle your colleagues your your classmate or college mates your teachers your mentors your friends your, your you know, or you surround them and ask them, people that see you in action, you don't have to be working yet. What are the three things that they see in you? And then look at the pattern. What are the three common things that most people say, this is who you are. This is what you are known for. All of this is an exercise that could help you start seeing what are you really passionate about? Because passion gives you purpose. His purpose is what I mean, what am I looking to become? We all came to this life and on this earth to have a purpose. We study and we cram and we go through so much hassle because we want to become something. Whatever that thing is that you want to become now, as we speak, could be that you want to be part of positive change, you want to start business, you want to get your dream job, whatever it is, you want to ask yourself. For example, and those were examples of things that, you know, each of you has uh, probably a different objective in life. Well, at least right now, it might change in a few years, in a few months. So let's say that purpose is to start your own business, okay? So I need to ask yourself five times. I'm sure you heard about this before. Why is it important to me to start a business? And once you get that answer, you ask again, why is that important to me when you answer that? And then you keep asking and digging deeper until you get to that bottom of why is it really important for you to start a business? You might say, well, because I want to be independent financially. I don't want to have a boss. Why is it important to you to not have a boss? And you keep digging, you keep digging. Do that with uh, some of your friends. It all, it really helps you. Sometimes there are so many things in our mind, but we just need to get to the habit of reflecting and listening to our inner talk to really find out what is really our purpose. Don't waste the time and let it come the hard way after you go and work and a corporate world and then you're not happy. If you can do this exercise now, it will help you to be much happier to link whichever job you will do to that passion, no matter what job you will have. And I have an example I want to share with you um, it's a story. I don't know how true it is, but it's out there. They say 1969, when uh, uh, John Kennedy was sending the first man on the moon to land on the moon, he was visiting NASA premises. And he met this man at the entrance. And he asked him, what, what do you do here? And the man answered, I'm helping the first man to land on the moon. And that man who answered that way was the janitor. He was sweeping the floor but he didn't see his job as sweeping the floor because he does work in NASA. And if he doesn't clean the place, they won't be able to think right. They won't be able to plan to go to the moon. So how amazing is to be able to link our job to something that's bigger rather than saying, oh, I'm just a janitor. So that's, that's an amazing example. It's, it's, it's really very inspirational. I always use it because in all my workshops, I ask, no matter, no matter what the job is, and I work from CEO to graduates like yourself, I always ask them, tell me what you do without telling me what you do. So start thinking of that job to a purpose, just like the janitor in NASA who said he's contributing to landing the first man on the moon. Another tool that I brought for you that can help you with that is what we call the TOP model. TOP is also an acronym for talent, what are we good at, opportunity, and passion, which we spoke about. Okay, so how do we do that? How can we identify our talent? We can start asking ourselves, what comes naturally to me? Again, I'll go back to the example, since I'm assuming most of you are still students, I'll go back to the example of, let's say, team projects. When we do team projects or activities in summer, or depending if you go to camps or what comes naturally? What is the first thing you said, I'm going to take care of this? If you're organizing a party, for example, with friends or, you know, running errands uh, with, with your parents at home, what is the first thing that people like, you do that because you're good at it? Or what do you feel like, I'm going to take that job or that role? 
what do you find others coming to you for again? So when people want new ideas and new themed ideas, they're like, okay, talk to Hanan because she, she's always, she's a dreamy person and she will always give you out of the box ideas. So what do you find others coming to you for? Okay, they won't come to me to draw because I'm very bad at drawing, but they will come to me to, for new ideas. So ask these questions. And the third one would be, what roles do you take up in a project? I think I anticipated that already. So this way you'll start identifying again, what is, the, what is your talent? Of course there are skills that we, um, we can acquire, but I'm talking about innate. What are our innate capacities? Because it's important for us to know our strengths and our innate capacities so we can leverage on them uh, when we want to find the best job or the best role. What do we excel at? So once we answer those questions, opportunity will be a question. What is the existing immediate opportunity? Could be something small that you choose to do today where your talent will intersect. And think about existing potential future opportunities. We might need to plan. We might need to really think about it. It will take time, but at least we want to know is with the talent that we have, are there big opportunities that this talent will be um, able to land me that opportunity? So when we think about opportunities, we need to dream big because they might be out there or they might need to be created. I just talked about how many job opportunities will, are, not, are not there because of all the change. Maybe in five years, if you just got to wait in today, by the time you start a job and by the time you plan that you want to be in where you want to be in five years, maybe what you will be in five years is not there yet. But we want to start dreaming big because at least when you start visualizing it, you might know how you're going to make it a possibility. And we talk about passion. It's what you do, what you do, to, what do you love to do? What motivates you to get up in the morning and all of that. I just, for me, for example, one thing feels amazing for me to create safe spaces for women and youth to thrive. That's something that drives me. I could say that if I have to give a passion statement, that would be it. And you could also create a board of people who are where you want to be. That also helps us. Those are my people, okay? So we might start thinking of role models. Why? Because when we identify people that we really love who they are and what they do, or we start thinking, why do I admire Steve Jobs? Why do I admire Sherry Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook? Why admire Michelle Obama? And I start thinking because of one, two, three, and then I start thinking, okay, what did they do well in their job that I can acquire? What are those traits that they have? Because that also helps us identify in our passions and our purpose. Now, first, once you find your passion, you need a second P. And the second P is proactivity, because that's not enough. And as the picture shows here, if opportunity doesn't knock, we need to build a door. Being proactive is the second P that drove my success or drove my career, which means simply taking control, making actions, but mainly being accountable for that, checking for solutions, but mainly letting go of things that we don't have control of. So many of us uh, abuse our energy and deplete our energy thinking about stuff that we have no control of. We have no control on Corona. We have no control on the economy slowing down. We have no control so many things. So why do I have to use my energy thinking about those? So we want to think of two circles. One circle is circle of concern. We want to really disactivate it, make it smaller, things that are not within our control. We know them, we acknowledge them, but I'm not gonna wake up every day and keep thinking about it. Oh, I can't succeed because the economy is slow because of Corona. No, that's, that's there, yes, but I'm not gonna keep thinking about it. I want to use my energy in whatever is in the circle of my influence, which is things that I, which are things I can change myself or improve. For example, my attitude, my responses, my mindset, because we cannot change what happens, but we can change the way we react to it. What we cannot control is other attitudes, others' perceptions, and others' mindset. Being pro I'm moving uh, fast because I think I don't want to run out of time. Being proactive also call for accountability. So how do you think we can be more accountable? Because sometimes we have the best intention. It's like, we're going to do this. I'm going to go and do the questions. I reflect on the questions that Hanan shared with us. But then uh, I get busy and I just get lazy. I'm like, whatever. I forget about it. So this is how we can become accountable. Establish goals. And trust me, study has it. 
When we write our goals, we increase the chance of achieving them by 30%. Sometimes like, no, I don't need to write it. I know what I want to do. No, please take that routine of writing it and keeping it in front of you. And neuroscience has it that it helps us. So, and have clear milestones and deadline. And I said, in writing, by next month, I'm gonna do this. By three months, I'm gonna do this. By end of year, this is my goal. Once you do that, it starts making your mind work for it. You feel accountable. Brainstorm with others, people you, you, um, you trust. Have an accountability buddy. I'm doing that because I want to admit to you, I'm somebody who flows with ideas, but sometimes I need to be grounded. I, I jump from one idea to another. So now I, since few years, I have accountability buddies. Somebody I trust, I'm like, listen, Laura, you will be sending me, this is, these are my goals and this is my objective and this is the deadline I put please send me a message or call me and tell me where you're at and really be assertive with me. It really helps. Have your friends check on you like, how are you progressing with your goals? Why are you delayed? Once you have that, you start being more disciplined rather than leaving it to yourself. So along with that skill, so we said passion is the first P, the proactivity is the second P that we need to be more proactive, accountable, put goals, knock on the doors, but even when we start knocking on doors, not every door we knock on will open. So to move forward, I needed to embrace the third P. And my third P was persistent. It means pushing. And pushing here means I needed to persist until something happens. Because I thought I was so excited. I was working for the government and everything was opening because it was the government. And then when I started my, my small business doing the same things, I was so, super excited about, I was so passionate, fiery. And then I started knocking doors and it didn't happen the way I thought. And I'm not gonna lie to you. Many times I felt like, oh my God, this is not what I expected. I almost felt I was gonna drop the ball, but then I needed, if I did not persist, I wouldn't be here. So we need to push, which means we need to persist until something happens. As they say, sometimes in life, everything will go smoothly. I think we can all relate to this for the past year. And then the unexpected happens. You know, that breaks. So the important thing is we have to start looking, how do we make from that crisis another opportunity? It's just a simple example, but it has a lot of food for thought. So to make what we love, to make what you love to do a reality, which is what you're passionate about, you have to keep finding ways to keep going and to keep going no matter what. So that summarizes my three Ps in one sentence. But do we need genius to succeed? Well, I don't think so, but don't take my word for it because I brought two geniuses who said something different and they agree with me. Albert Einstein said, I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. And Isaac Newton said, if I have ever made any valuable discoveries, it has been owing more to patient attention than to any other talent. Two geniuses tell us, two skills that I feel that are the skills for the future, which we refer to today as the 21st century skills, which each of you needs to embrace if you want to succeed in your career. Critical thinking and problem solving. You need to be critical thinking. You need to question. You need to think as a problem solver. You're not offering a service. You're not an architect. You're not a graphic designer. You're somebody who knows through graphic design, through architecture, how to solve the problem of their target audience. You need to start thinking this way. What am I doing? How can I do what I'm doing to position it as a problem solving service rather than just what it is in technicality? Curiosity, like Einstein said, and imagination, because things change so fast. We need to be curious. We need to keep imagining how things can be collaboration, silos won't work. You cannot be a one man or one woman show anymore because we need to innovate and two minds think better than one as they say. And I have a saying that I always use, none of us is smarter than all of us. No matter how smart you can be, when you tap into the collective intelligence, you can create miracles. So collaboration, and these are, by the way, you can look them up, you can look up 21st century skills and I just brought some of those, agility and adaptability. And I think I don't even have to pitch this anymore. It used to be hard. And after COVID-19 pandemic, I think this word is one of the best buzzwords that it goes without saying, it's a no brainer. 
we need to be agile. We need to be ready to adapt all the time. Initiative, which is entrepreneurship for me, and I spoke about that, communication. Because if you're not gonna be able to have right or unwritten communication, then, you know, Siri could do the job. Sophia could do the job. But what will make you, what will make you different as a human is these skills because that's what robots can do, at least not yet, or at least in our lifetime. Assessing and analyzing information. Information won't be the issue. We have actually tsunami of data now and of information, but the skill that we'll need is how to assess and how to analyze information. And what I wanna close with is always ask yourself, use this two, these two words, what if? Once you keep asking, what if I can do my job differently? What if we think of solving the problems in a different way? Once you use the what if, you can have infinite possibilities. Because at the end of the day, the purpose of our life is to live a life of purpose. I took that leap. You see, I don't just walk on shaky bridges. I jump also from summits. And the third picture, you can see small thing. That's how far, how down I was. That was in Zimbabwe. So sometimes we go into life and career with a leap of faith, just like what I did here. I had to be confident, although knowing that I'm taking a risk and my eyes were closed in the second picture, but I needed to know that that cord is safe enough and it's gonna keep me there. Because if I don't take that risk, I wouldn't have seen that amazing view on Victoria Falls. So as you can see, I can, I'm bringing a lot of analogies because I like to learn from experience and those reflections after I go and travel and do these activities, I come back and I come with this reflection that keeps me going as an entrepreneur. So that's it. I hope you are ready to reset the way you're thinking about your career, to reset the way you want to move forward. Thank you for listening to me. I hope we have still some few minutes if you have any questions or any feedback. And again, I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity. As you can see, I keep buzzing every time I have a chance to share my experience and to, to have a chance to inspire some of you. So thank you. Here I am. Thank you, Hannah. And that was really eye-opening and really inspirational. I, you know, there's so much to think about. I hope everyone feels the same here um, in terms of reflection and, you know, to, to position yourself in the ever-growing market. Um, it was amazing. Really, thank you for taking the time to join us for this opportunity. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there are, since we still have like six minutes. Yeah, um, there was a question that popped up earlier um, about uh, the robots and how we could also think about, you know, future jobs. And the question was, won't robots decrease the chance of getting employed? As I said, yes. And there are, I even showed the fact that many, many jobs will be taken by robots. Mm. But, but um, there, every time, like I said, every technological, every revolution took away jobs that created new ones. You know, when there were no cars, um, when the, when the in that first industrial revolution happened, the farmers lost their job as farmers, but then they joined industrial and they joined manufacturing. So it's about us being open to what jobs am I still able to take? How mm. can I serve? How can I ab adapt myself and be relevant? Like I said, that's why we need to think about who am I serving and how can I adapt myself? Because job um, um, robots cannot still cannot create, they're programmed. Yeah. So the human skills, probably being human will become a skill that we need to learn. So being human, being able to communicate, being able to create, to innovate uh, in whichever job that you have, that's what's going to give you the edge. So it's not about, robots will take the jobs, but it's about me orienting myself to become a knowledge worker, to become somebody who can innovate so I can have that edge that robots don't have. True. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I, have Laura, I, I have a question I would like to ask. I mean, you know, uh, Hanan is so passionate and, and her, her speech was so inspirational. I have to say something. <laughs> so, first, thank you. Thank you so much for this, really, really. And thank you for accepting our invitation. Really an inspirational talk. So, so, so Hanan, you, you showed one image that I, I, I appreciate showing, you know, this big wave and, and someone is surfing on the wave. Uh, you know, uh, the idea was to try to navigate or surf and uh, how you can, you know, um, use the wave in your own advantage in a sense. So what do you do if uh, 
the di- you know, we know that there's a wave, but what if the direction of the wave is not in line with the direction that you want? So what do you do in this situation? Okay. Well, as I said, when I looked at that wave, the wave is there. So the wave of disruption is disrupting everything we do. And we need to, if we, if we know how to ride it, it will take us to those new shores of opportunities, which means we need to change our direction because the wave is coming and we have to follow it. And I'm going to give an example here of, um, before the example, I'm going to say that what we need is also, that comes from a quote from uh, uh, an American philosopher he said, Alvin Toffler, his name is Alvin Toffler, and he's a futuristic. I would really advise you to read about him and, and to read one of his books. He said, the illiterate of 21st century won't be the person who cannot read or write, but will be the person who cannot learn and learn and relearn. Mm. So it's very important. And as an answer to the, to the participant who, um, who asked about robots taking jobs, if we are stuck in and having a fixed mindset, this is what I studied, but the robots have taken my job. Okay, but we need, you need to unlearn that and relearn new things. So um, we need, this is, this is the growth mindset that I call. We have to be ready to forget what we learn if it's no longer uh, useful, if it's no longer relevant and be willing. And it's tough because we as humans are stuck. This is what I know, I'm a PhD, this is what I learned, I have 30 years of experience, what do you mean I'm no longer relevant? So we need to be adapted, adaptable and be willing to go with that wave. The example I wanted to share with you is they say, um, there's this company who was making shoes and they sent two salespeople to, uh, to expand, to find new market because the market was saturated, they were not selling anymore. So he said, we need to find new opportunities. So he sent two people, two different salespeople. The two different salespeople came back. The first one said, we have no chance. Those people don't even wear shoes. They go barefooted. The other person like, oh my God, it's a huge opportunity. Nobody wears shoes. Same fact, same insight, two different reactions. One saw the opportunity, one saw that. You see, so it's about us, it's that mindset. How can we create that opportunity? And how can we redirect our ways? To, to see, to, to let that wave take us to opportunity. So when you cannot control the wave, you control the way you think about the wave. Absolutely, the way you react, yeah. definitely. Yes, yeah. totally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanan. I did have a question, but I think the answer was filtered in there with the, with the answer for George's question. So really, thank you so much for the time and the efforts and this amazing presentation. Thank you so right. much. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. You can always look me up if you need any uh, guidance. I'd be happy to work with you. And I wish you all the best with your career in this VUCA world. Remember, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Have an amazing journey because life is about journey and, uh, and learn on the way. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining the session. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.